Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miras. Today I'm speaking with philosopher Matthew K. Minard about the sense of mystery in the works of the French Dominican theologian Garigou Lagrange. Hey, everybody. I'm sure some of you listening have heard of the theologian Father Reginald Garigou Lagrange, a French Dominican of the early 20th century. Until relatively recently, outside of traditionalist circles, his name has been very much associated with a type of Thomism that is supposedly rigid and overly concerned with the works of various commentators in the centuries following St. Thomas Aquinas, rather than focusing on the original works of St. Thomas themselves, a way of doing theology and studying St. Thomas Aquinas, which was considered to be basically unhip and outdated. That evaluation of him is now changing, and one sign of that is a series of new translations of Father Garigou Lagrange's works from the French, which is being published by MAS Academic Press, Scott Hahn's outfit. And the first of these, published in 2017, was a book called The Sense of Mystery. Having read this, I will say that Garigou Lagrange is a profound and subtle thinker, and certainly not, for whatever shortcomings he may have, certainly not someone to be dismissed as an irrelevant old fuddy-duddy. Now, the book is quite technical, uh, but I have the translator of the work to hopefully make some of the central themes of Father Gargou Lagrange accessible, and I think we did a pretty good job, so I'm looking forward to sharing this with you. The translator of this book, Matthew Minerd, I met him back a few years ago at a meeting of the American Maritan Association, and since we originally met, he has accomplished quite a bit. He's gotten his PhD in philosophy from Catholic University. Uh, he's now a professor of philosophy and moral theology at the Byzantine Catholic Seminary of St. Cyril and Methodius in Pennsylvania. And he's been very impressively prolific in the past couple of years, uh, working on a number of translations of Garigou Lagrange and other authors and writing a number of his own original articles. And I'm actually going to link to an article that he wrote for the Homiletic and Pastoral Review uh, on the importance of chastity in the broader moral life. I think it's a really wonderful treatment of the topic and uh, and I think an accessible piece to read. So definitely check that out, the show notes page, catholicculture.org slash episode 38. Matthew, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Good to be with you today. The topic of our discussion today is someone who has been accused at times of not having a sense of mystery. And I had a thought last night, and I, I have a feeling you'll like this, just that saying someone doesn't have the sense of mystery because they make a lot of subtle distinctions, and this is something they say about Thomas Aquinas as well, saying someone doesn't have the sense of mystery because they make a lot of subtle and complex distinctions is like saying that the music of Bach has no mystery. But there is a reason that sometimes people can miss the mystery. It's that, in a sense, it's easier to hear mystery in something that is overtly simple, because the discursive reason can get distracted from the fundamental simplicity that exists in something when it's given a lot of complex material to grab onto. But that doesn't mean the complexity doesn't arise from and ultimately lead to uh, kind of simplicity. Yeah, I mean, the Bach image is great, too, because, you know, if you think, we, you know, we think of these massive fugues that are incredibly worked out, really, I mean, to distinct degrees, I mean, with a masterful hand, right? You have also the same man who wrote these, these wonderful chorales, which are nothing more than, you know, peasant hymns that then he, you know, as a, a, a great organist sort of stuck all of the, the harmonization onto that he did that really is, I mean, incredibly complex. And yet, I mean, in a way, it's it's simple as well. So anyway, I mean, I just think there's something to mull over there in what you say. Perhaps you can tell us a bit of Garigou Lagrange. I mean, just starting off with when was he alive? What were the the circumstances and the the situation in the church he was dealing with as a theologian? What were some of his major accomplishments? What he's known for? So Father Garigou was born, you know, at the end of the 19th century, 1877. 
And he I was a professor at the Angelicum for almost, I think, 60 years. I mean, it was from, oh, around 1910 all the way up until the late 50s, early 60s. Mm. He starts to lose his physical faculties in the late 50s. In a lot of ways, he's you know, a transitional figure between the first Vatican Council and the second Vatican Council. And this comes through you know, in, in all, of his, all of his writing. I jokingly said to a, a student once in the seminary who was an ex-Latin Catholic who had read a lot of Garrigou Lagrange, and I said to him, I said, well, you have to remember, and I was unreflecting my comment, you have to remember that the first Vatican Council was his second Vatican Council. And for all of those men, particularly of that era. So if you think of someone who's born in 1877 and who early enough in their life joins a religious order like the Dominicans, the basic guideposts of the discussion for a theologian of the era in the early 1900s would really be the fallout uh, within Catholic culture regarding the nature of revelation, as well as, of course, the questions of the papacy. But that was not his side of Vatican I, really. But issues instead about the scope and possibilities of human reason, the nature of theology, you know, all of these issues were kind of crystallized at Vatican I. And so after a few years of teaching on a local studium, Father Garrigou Lagrange went on, as I said, for decades to teach at the Angelicum. And from what I recall off the top of my head right now, he taught, I think, for most of that time, a course in metaphysics. And I think he approached along the lines of just leading the students through Aquinas' commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics, actually. A uh, very straight textualist sort of approach that way. And also, too, I think through all that career, uh, his famed sequence of spiritual theology courses, which were able, especially in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, to fill the, the grand hall of the Angelicum. And so people know often of his work because of the two volume series, The Three Ages of the Spiritual Life. But there were a number of other derivative works in spiritual theology that came out of that. So you have sort of two pillars of him teaching. One is, is sort of a philosophical pillar as a metaphysician, and the other, which is his, his work as a theologian of spiritual theology. And then kind of the spine of his thought, though, I think very often, especially having spent a good bit of time translating works of his for publication coming up here in the next couple of years, is actually, or actually the problems of the nature of revelation, the ascent of faith, the nature of theology as a science, all of these issues really on the, what we could think of as the spine separating the natural order from the supernatural order really were a linchpin for his thought. He commented on a significant amount of the Summa Theologiae. And as Father Sayward, John Sayward said to me once, he really should be seen somewhat in continuity with the later Dominican commentators, because really he carries forward into the early 20th century conversation, a lot of those old scholastic conversations. And so you get his treatment of various treatises of the Summa Theologiae on God as one, God as three, on Beatitude, Christology, the theological virtues, the sacraments. Cluny is actually going to be publishing a volume on that here, I think later this year, actually. Hmm. And then finally, if I may be excused for this lengthy bit, there's also his, his really massive and in some ways monumental and centrally important text, De Revelazione, two volumes probably owe the equivalent of 1,200 pages in English, maybe more actually. The Emmaus Academic will be publishing at the beginning of next year, the first volume, or maybe middle of next year, and then the following year, the second volume. And a lot of the main themes of all of his other works really are found there. So anyway, that's just a kind of conspectus of works, but I think it's important to have some idea of, of the breadth of his theological work. Now, would he be the, the most well-known figure of the sort of the neo-Thomism initiated by Pope Leo XIII, as opposed to the neo-Thomism that came later with figures like Jacques Maritain. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I've become reticent to call a lot of the Dominicans of that era neo-Thomists. You know, after the French Revolution, I mean, the Catholic mind is shattered in a lot of ways. So it really, there had to be a revival of philosophy. But the Dominicans kept the flame alight in a way that not necessarily the rest of the church did. And so there's a kind of continuity of conversation within the, the Dominicans all the way through the 19th century and early 20th century. But if we're going to use the expression, because everyone does, neo thomist yeah, Gary Lagrange is a good example of this early generation responding to the, the universal call to really kind of almost you know, evangelically proclaim Thomism. But there are lots of different forms of neo-Thomism. But really, it's important to see Garrigou as, as this Dominican theologian, a kind of Dominican neo-Thomism. 
there are many ways that Maritain is actually deeply, deeply, deeply indebted to him. I would like to someday write a monograph on that, but I probably never will because I don't think I have the guts to do that. But anyway, so that, yeah, he, he's very much this, you know, you can say first or maybe even like the first and a half wave because he's a little bit, a little young. You, you have some figures before him, but I see. And of course, you know, for people should know that he was the dissertation director for Pope St. John Paul II. I don't know how deep his influence went, but are there any other figures that we would know that he was fairly influential on? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, it might be interesting for folks to know that even rather progressive theologians were rather influenced by Father Gary Lagrange, two figures that just stuck out to me uh, quite obviously. And they're somewhat well known among those who, who study Father Gary Lagrange's thought are um, Yves Congar and Marie Dominique Chenu, who were both rather progressive during the Second Vatican Council. But it was actually a retreat that Father Gary gave in the 30s, I believe, that led Congar to leave his diocesan seminary to enter the Dominican order. And Chenu, who is well known as a medievalist and a historical theologian, and even is well respected in certain circles of liberation theology, was the heir apparent for Garrigou at the Angelicum, actually, after he finished his dissertation on mystical experience under Father Garrigou Lagrange. But a number of French Dominican figures, you know, were influenced by him. Also, too, in, in the English speaking world. What would be the major controversy that Father Garrigou was involved in? And how did that influence his ongoing reception and the way people have thought about him to this day? Yeah, there are two. The one that sticks with people in the English speaking world the most is the controversy in the 40s and 50s, but it really starts burbling up actually in the mid 30s over Nouvelle Theologie. And of course, we know figures like Ratzinger would be included among those who would be called you know, new theologians nowadays after a kind. But it really started against a couple of different Jesuit authors, and it did include minorly Henri de Lubac, as well as the philosopher Maurice Blondel. I mean, quite strongly, but, but charitably, Father Garrigou was quite against some of the philosophical theories regarding the nature of truth in particular that Blondel espoused. And so Garrigou became known as this you know, sort of theologian against all change in dogma, which first of all is not true. I've just done too much reading of his works. He didn't have a sensitivity to doctrinal development like a lot of the theologians in the 40s and 50s did. But folks felt that he, as well as a couple of other Dominicans and then Jesuits as well who taught in Rome, really were unfair to these you know, new theologians. And so certain forces in the 60s really solidified in the minds of sort of the church broadly that, that Garrigou is the image of those who would be against a sort of contemporary and in-touch theology that can deal with problems of history. So that's, I mean, the controversy that has burned him into the minds of a number of people. And it divides even very faithful Catholics. You know, I know the John Paul II Institute at Catholic University, where I attended, would have grave reticence over the thought of Garrigou because they're very much Dulabachians, uh, I guess one could say that. Yeah, so it's unfortunate. I mean, that's the one that sticks out. In the French world, there's the whole political issue too, though. Both mm -hmm. his, basically, his basically monarchist outlook as well as things surrounding support for the, the Vichy government during World War II. I mean, nothing that's immoral. It's not as though he was any sort of a sympathizer whatsoever with the German government. But a lot of conservative French clerics really were, were thrown by the wayside because of their support for Vichy. But there is a sort of ongoing revival in Garrigou Lagrange outside of the traditionalist world at this point, it would seem. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a Byzantine Catholic who's translating him, you can say it's officially left the Latin traditionalist world. <laughs> oh, you're a Byzantine Catholic? Yeah, yeah, I'm canonically a Ruthenian Catholic. Oh, I see. I mean, I was raised, I was raised Roman Catholic, but I, I find it just, you know, a little bit strange to be in this position, but my training kind of put me there. But yeah, you've got work like being done at Clooney Press. Father Cajet and Cuddy is working with a couple of folks to translate a couple of volumes. There have been these recent studies, they would have been unthinkable in the 60s, 70s, and 80s by Father Richard Petticord, the sacred monster of Thomism that was published, I think, in the early 2000s by St. Augustine Press. 
And then Father Aidan Nichols, he had a volume, Reason with Piety, Gary Lagrange in the Service of Catholic Thought, which provides a kind of overview of as much as you can do in 150 pages of, of sort of the main themes throughout his work. So yeah, there's a sense that, you know, at least some kind of appropriation of his thought should be done in a sober manner. Not all the answers are found there, I assure you. I've spent too much time there. I, I'm well aware of its deficiencies, but I myself am working on probably the translation of four or five more volumes that will be coming out over the next couple of years, too. So let's get into the book titled The Sense of Mystery, Clarity and Obscurity in the Intellectual Life. Now, this is a, a very broad topic. Obviously, it covers a lot of different themes from Gargu's theology in light of this idea of the sense of mystery. And he starts out by talking about, well, maybe he doesn't start with this, but pretty early on, he, he talks about the different types of clarity and the different types of obscurity. So can you talk about that a little bit? What is he talking about when he means says clarity and obscurity? Yeah, well, so the, the actual reference is to the painting style, chiaroscuro, correct? That's how one says it, I believe. Chiaroscuro. Yes. Okay, good. This is, I'm a, a Slav from Western Pennsylvania, so... Uh, you have to excuse <laughs> my right. my ignorances, but it's yeah, right. the, the title in the title in French is is actually that it's the the intellectual chiaroscuro that it's you know that the idea that our our knowledge, I mean, of so, some of the most basic realities that we know are these mixtures of very certain things and very obscure aspects as well, and so he considers you know sort of the whole swath of both the kind of that which is lowest matter, prime matter for the Thomists in the room, but materiality itself is a great mystery. The Thomists told that, you know, matter and form are principles of everything, but matter's undefined, but it's a real kind of potency. And it's an incredibly difficult thing to actually express. But kind of at the heights, you know, the knowledge we have of God is a knowledge that's, you know, it's so blinding for us here below. I mean, that we're like, you know, like the famous line from Aristotle, like bats that flit about in, in light that's too bright for our eyes. And yet there are things that we can know with, with rock solid certainty about God. We can know the divine names, the divine attributes, right? Even the philosopher can know this, that God is the highest goodness. God is the highest beauty. God is he who is eminently one. God is self-subsistent existence. And yet somehow in God, these are all eminently one thing in the Godhead. And so there's, you know, right there and just, you know, sort of this, these sort of simple looking proofs of God's existence, and the divine names, you have this blinding combination of utter certainty for the metaphysician, but also too an incredible awareness of the, the weakness of our concepts. And so throughout the text, he considers, you know, a number of themes related to this, you know, some of it seems odd. He talks about sensation. Actually, the phenomena of sensation is something that's actually quite obscure. What separates the plant from the animal is something he even holds that really we can't completely articulate in this lifetime. And that's striking whenever you think that he's supposedly this manualist who, who kind of is superficial as a thinker and doesn't, doesn't have an awareness, according to certain narratives, of these profound mysteries and our inability to know things. One of the ideas that struck me early on was this idea that there is obscurity from on high and obscurity from below. So there is obscurity. He talks about the proper object of the human intellect being sensible being, right? Or in intelligible being, I should say, intelligible being insofar as it's perceived abstracted from sensible things. So pure being as such just grasped directly whether our own or angels or of God is is above our intellect. So those things are obscurity from on high. And yet there is an obscurity from below and that would maybe take a little more explaining, but I'd be interested to hear your your explanation of what he says about that. Yeah, and so you very well kind of reformulated my last answer to to put it directly in his terms. So mostly what I was talking about actually was the obscurity from on high, which of course we could dwell on, but obscurity from below, you know, one of the examples that he gives in the text, and I believe I get lost in these books, but I believe it's even the epigram for the text, is about the mystery of evil. Evil is a kind of non-being, right? This is the Augustinian insight, and it's, it's very strongly in Aquinas' account of evil. And I mean, non-being is a very difficult thing to talk about, because we only know it indirectly, so to speak. 
you know, we formulate the idea of non-consideration of the rule of reason. That's how the Thomists speak of what causes evil. But we're talking about a nothingness, like it's a something. So this is, you know, a universal phenomenon that we experience that's, you know, really unable to be grasped at directly. Or once again, this idea of potency and matter. You know, too often people read, well, not okay, not that many people, but people who've you know, gone to Christendom College, I think, like you had, you did, or Thomas Aquinas College, or maybe Catholic, you read the physics of Aristotle, and they think they have this little story about the four causes pretty easily down, and matter and potency, or act and potency, and matter and form. But matter, potency, these are things that are not, actually not defined. So Aristotle teaches an intrinsic principle of all things is its determining element, form, and whatever receives that determination, matter. But that means matter is undetermined, and the undetermined is something that can't be defined. And yet we truck in these things, even whenever we're not being philosophers, all the time. I assure your, your listeners who are not sort of the ex experts in these things, or who are not you know, philosophers by training, that all the time, whenever we talk about things, matter and form are involved. And that's an, there's an element of that that's actually not clear, precisely because it's undefined. So that's what he's reflecting on there. I mean, the issue is with Father Gehrig, very deceptively simple. And yet he's also dealing with these issues of, you know, Aristotelian philosophy that are, shall we say, not table conversation, at least normal tables. <laughs> right. So it's interesting. So you're, you were talking about how matter as such is mysterious. But there's also this idea of matter being mysterious in terms of individuality, ma because matter is the principle of individuality, meaning what distinguishes two things with the same form from one another is their matter that they take part in. So I don't know how to quite approach it, but there's this idea that individuality itself, we tend to think as moderns, individuality is what makes us special, and, and there's something to that, but it's not quite so simple that individuality is itself just a sort of unmitigated highest good. It actually derives from a sort of a lack of being, which makes it obscure. Am I, am I getting somewhere correct there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's actually personality that, that we should be most concerned with, mm. right, as moderns as being the thing that defines us. But yeah, for, you know, two separate trees, if you try to define actually what it is that makes them exist as separate, I mean, at least on an Aristotelian model of matter and form, what you actually are saying is, well, they have the same basic life structure, the same form. But what makes them distinct is the undetermined reception of that form. And that very fact is, it's, it's like saying there's something almost indefinable that makes them individually what they are. And this is why actually you have that maxim from St. Thomas, probably cited by Gergo in the book, actually, that the individual is ineffable because the individual can't be defined. Right. So, well, that's, yeah, I mean, uh, he also talks about it. It's because it's, there's a difference between the human being has an intelligible form. It's not, I, I, I'm probably not getting this right, but the human being has a form that is intelligible sort of gosh i i'm having trouble with this but yeah i think i think i know exactly what you're getting at is he holds that the only thing that we can have in our experience a an actual definition of like a real definition of is the human person right. he basically thinks that all of our knowledge in the sciences it's is it, his ideas more it's not a positivism but it's closer to a kind of positivism that we can at best know accidents and proper accidents of things but that we actually only have a real definition of the human person precisely because of our in own intelligible structure as spiritual beings. Right. I mean, it's a fascinating point because once again, you have a sense that he's saying we don't have essential definitions of anything other than that, at least in our physical knowledge. I mean, there's part of me that wants to say there are many qualifications we should make to this. But in any case, he's well aware of the fact that neat and tight definitions are actually a quite difficult affair. And this is something right out of out of St. Thomas as well. Yeah. And this as an artist, this also made me sort of think hard because we talk about the mystery in beauty, in sensible beauty, or what is behind sensible beauty. And this would seem to imply that part of the mystery of the beauty of material things is also due to the 
the sort of obscurity due to inferiority to the the proper object of the human intellect, but it is also mysterious in terms of its participation in God. So it's like there's a mystery due to its less full participation and also due to that participation which it does have. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, of course, the, the Thomist will always want to say it's primarily because of that transcendental characteristic of beauty, which is going to be kind of the from on high right. history that, that beauty gets its character. But each little beauty, each little work of Bach is this unique reflection of the incommunicable beauty of God. And so, I mean, individual experiences of beauty do have like a kind of uniqueness that's only possible precisely because they're finite. And so, you know, finitude itself, yeah, does contain I mean, it contains and refracts the beauty. And so the refracting, which would be something like the mystery from, from below, also is a source of the, the manifold character of beauty. You know, it's somewhat like the Platonic theme of the receptacle. The Platonists love the idea of the images capturing the ideas. It's a kind of non-being that is. Hmm. So that's the, the mystery. That's the mystery of, of individual things or particular beauties. Yeah. Yes. And you could say the same thing about human beings. I mean, personality being the most important thing. That that aside, you could say, well, the individuality is due to participation in matter, which is sort of a lesser participation in, in being, but it also has value precisely because it is different. Each one is different from the other, and each one reflects something of God each person reflects something of God, even just as an individual, that the other does not. So it's not that we could sort of put everybody together and then get a picture of God from that, but it is refracted, as you say. Yeah, there's nothing more beautiful than someone who lifts their finite conditions in a moral, and we would say as Catholics, a divine way through the life of grace. Like you make the conditions of your life, which come from individuality, shine with the beauty of, of moral goodness, artistic goodness, the divine goodness of grace. And the supreme case of this, and the most beautiful case of individuality, which is supremely distinct from personality, is the case of Christ. Because Christ has a, and this is straight from Father Gary de Lagrange, Christ has an uncreated personality, the personality of the Word, and yet his human nature is individuated. And so you have a case there in his human nature, you know, of a kind of refraction in his human nature of the uncreated beauty. I mean, this is the whole theme of theandric acts, for instance. One cannot begin to contemplate the way that those human acts, as particular and instantiated moments in salvation history, uniquely reflected in the most bright light beauty. And we don't, but we don't just, we don't just contemplate when we contemplate the hypostatic union, just the word as the second person imminent in the Trinity. We contemplate that great mystery that the individuality of the human nature of Christ bore the weight of such a great beauty from on high in this particular way. I think, anyway, so just a sorry, just a thought that came to my mind. No, no, that's that's really great. I think that I'm going to have to study this issue of personality more because I used to have it sort of conflated with individuality. So oh, well this is a funny thing because I, I think there's a footnote in the sense of mystery, and this comes up in some of my other work on Garrigou. There's this distinction between personality and individuality that it's another one of these great third rails among Thomists and Catholics today because of a whole debate that un unfurled between Jacques Maritain and Charles de Conic. Mm. And I've run across certain traditionalists who read Garrigou Lagrange, and they've, they've stumbled across how Garrigou uses this distinction, and they're, they're sort of shocked because they think it's Maritain. And, and actually, they are the same on this. Right. Yes, I knew Maritain. I thought that Maritain was where I first ran across that distinction, and I was actually suspicious of it at first. But I, it's now that I've read some Garrigou and, and understood you know, matter as the principle of individuation and all that, it makes more sense to me. Yeah. So anyway, so for your, I mean, just for your listeners, this is an example of something where one must be very careful when looking at the history, because I know of stuff from the late 40s that, where you find Garrigou using this, this particular seemingly picky and little metaphysical distinction for exactly the same political ends as Maritain, which is striking given that, that they fell out over politics. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So proceeding on to the idea of things that are above and below the human intellect, of course, there are also pure spirits out there who do not know things through matter, but know 
themselves directly. I was really struck, by the way, by this point very late in the book where he mentions, this is just an aside, but where he mentions that in a chapter on pure spirits where he mentions that pure spirits know themselves directly and human human beings don't. And that like really struck me. It was just another very striking example of the frailty of the the human intellect is that even self-knowledge, which would seem to be such a fundamental human value going back to the Greeks, is very weak in us in that sense. Yeah, it's it the tome is sold. It's indirect, it's reflective. We only know the essence of our soul through the acts that we have of knowledge. I mean, it's all very secondary, the way that we know that we actually come to know ourselves. There's some profound things written on this by by Maritan and by Garrigou Lagrange's uh, teacher, Father Ambrose Gardet. So I was surprised to see him say that not only does the human intellect, which knows through sensation, only know the spiritual negatively. Now, now that part makes sense because, in other words, we, we use the word immaterial. The spiritual is defined as what isn't material. We don't know it directly. Infinite is described as that which isn't finite. But he also says that the pure spirits only know matter negatively as that which is not spirit. And I was a little bit surprised at this because it seems to me that, at first at least, that what is higher should sort of encompass and know what is lower. Yeah, I'm just not sure exactly what to say to that because it's just sort of a minor issue. I mean, he's not really focusing there on on the limitations of of angelic knowledge. I mean, what's particularly of of importance there for him is the fact that that our knowledge is actually so negative with regard to the spiritual realm. Right. If I may make a just a remark about these limits in human knowledge, what's interesting is he talks, as you've pointed out, about how our knowledge is negative of things like immateriality. The spiritual world is not material. But the first place he, he says that we actually get a grab on that is when we try to understand what sensation is. Because following the, the Thomas school, he holds that even sense knowledge in animals is a kind of non-material reception of what is known. Oh, really? It's not spiritual, but it's, yeah, but it's non-material. And he, he makes this point, I can't remember if it's in here or some other works, that this is an example of already even trying to understand what just sensation is as being, you know, different from, you know, a cup becoming warm is very different than a sense of touch, sensing the other thing being warm. And coming to, to define what that difference is, he thinks is immensely difficult. Precisely because it's already an example of us trying to grasp our hands around immateriality. And it's, I can, on very technical grounds, I can defend that as well. I mean, it's, it's a profound thought. I've meditated on it very much. He has an interesting discussion of the relationship between common sense and philosophy. And it's interesting because he says that philosophy wonders at everything. It wonders at the slightest things like even things that we take for granted in common sense, like sensation and motion. And because philosophy sees the mystery in these things, certain philosophical systems, you know, going back to the pre-Socratics, are led to deny these things because they're so hard to explain from universal causes. Whereas common sense sees and acknowledges and takes for granted what it's in front of it, and it is not even aware that there is an underlying mystery. And this is one of the things that has to be very carefully balanced in philosophy. Yeah, and if anything, Father Gehrig is a kind of great proponent of common sense. The The second chapter of this book, where he has this you know, little reflection on the verb to be and its meaning and its scope, is kind of a reflection on how our, our language of just using the verb to be hides sometimes from us the immense mystery right under our gaze. And so he, he holds that, I mean, all philosophy comes out of kind of common sense knowledge that the common man has that then is reflected on and scrutinized, you know, under the light of first principles. So, you know, philosophy in a way is this, this orderly appropriation of what starts in common sense, just in the, you know, not in the sense of like common sense, like someone like Thomas Reed, the modern philosopher, but common sense just as in the common knowledge of humans. You know, he says at certain points, you know, and so when people decide to go down crazy paths like Parmenides or Heraclitus or whatever great things we may say about them, the fact that they come up with such, you know, wild ideas that break with common sense actually is a mark of the fact that there's something wrong with their philosophy. And even his great text on this, which Emmaus Academic is going to be probably publishing next year, we have, we're working on the right, the rights from the French. He makes the point that even this holds for, you know, truths of faith, that 
you know, even something like transubstantiation is not a kind of canonization of the Thomist idea or Aristotelian idea of substance. It's actually a use of the common sense notion of, of substance, that while it has been articulated by theologians, common sense is actually really what's used so that any believer can believe that, yeah, the substance of, of bread and wine is now changed into the very presence of you know, Christ and his crucifixion and, and in his glory. And so common sense plays this big role for him. That's all. So yeah, common sense and the idea that, that underlies the most fundamental things in our knowledge is really important for him. I think we before, as a transition into his theology, perhaps it would be good to discuss a little bit that idea of the verb to be. He says every verb is reducible to the verb to be. If I say I sing, then that means I am singing. But even that verb, as you said, is not so simple as it might seem. So we have this idea, that, and this also leads us to the topic of analogy. So perhaps could you talk about, not perhaps not all, but some of the different senses of the verb to be, as will be relevant to his theology, and what is the concept of analogy in Thomism, which is of crucial importance? Yeah. So let's just, you know, we'll use, we'll use this verb to be to kind of unpack the idea of analogy. As Father Garrigou teaches it, you can't swing a cat in a room filled with tomes without them fighting over analogy. But this is what he thinks. So, you know, if you just think about it, I am a human. Right? When I say that, I, I say something about what I am essentially, and we could say substantially. Right? The verb to be there is telling me or expressing the way that the substantial predicate, humanity, is related to me as an individual. But if I say, you know, I'm a philosopher. Well, the verb to be there means something has a very different sense. I'm attributing something to myself to be a philosopher. It's a kind of quality. It's, it's you know, I've never walked down the road and seen philosophy or philosophizing without seeing a person who philosophizes. And so this is the, you know, well-known distinction between substance and accidents. And you could run this, this kind of comparison, you know, a number of different ways. But the Thomists hold that being, among other things, is a, a notion that has many different meanings, each of which are really true, but they're different. And this doesn't just go across substance and accidents. But whenever I say that I exist, I'm talking about a kind of finite existence, which is very different than talking about God who exists by his very nature. Somehow, my language doesn't break whenever I use the notion of being to talk about myself and to talk about God. And yet, the sense of the two words is immensely different. And indeed, as he says in many works, that technically it's more different than it's the same. This is the, there's a famous line from Fourth Ladder and Council along these lines, that anything we say about God drawn from creatures, that God is, is more different, has a greater dissimilarity than it has a similarity. So this notion of being, to say there's an analogy between created beings and the, he who is the infinite being, it's very, it's very difficult. It's tempted many theologians to say that actually what you're doing is just using two different notions, what would be called equivocation. And it's what separates the Scotists from the Thomists, but we don't need to go down that line. Hmm. So there's also an analogy of truth, is there not? Yeah. I mean, if truth is not said the same I mean, in, even in disciplines, right? This is Aristotle's idea that each discipline has its own method and its own manner of knowing truth. Great example that's quite clear in various works of Father Gary Lagrange is truth is, is different if we're talking speculatively, mathematical truth or truth in metaphysics, that being is divided into act and potency. Okay, that's true. Doesn't matter if any human is alive, that's always true. But it's very different than moral truth or practical truth particularly in its strongest form, which would be the command of prudence. Because truth of prudence is actually conformity with right appetite, the Thomists teach. And so truth is analogical. And for this reason, too, you know, whenever we talk about God as the highest truth, well, he's the highest naturally knowable truth. The philosopher can know God through metaphysical reflection. But then in himself and supernaturally, he's supernaturally the highest of truths as well. And that's, you know, the truthfulness of he who never changes is immensely different that way too. So perhaps we can conclude our discussion of analogy just by distinguishing it from metaphor, because some people might make that conflation, which is a mistake. 
Yeah, but this is exactly why I was pointing to this idea that people might think analogy is a kind of equivocation. Because the meaning of, for example, being, when I talk about the passing and changing being of a human person and God is so different, someone would say, it's a metaphor. You're basically just attributing a word that has different meanings in each case. And metaphor plays an incredibly important role in our, in our discourse. You know, you, Thomas, have a profound intellect. Profound is nothing more than deep, right? We're taking a spatial notion and expressing this fact. There's a great book by a guy named, I think, Lakoff on this. But this would be the, the objection by certain folks. Like, I mean, I think Scotus say this against Thomists, that your idea of analogy, you're basically saying about God with being, the word being, the same thing that you would be saying with the word angry, right? I mean, definitely God is not angry in the same way that humans are because God doesn't have emotions the way we do. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of heavy lifting to make that distinction, though. But it's a very important point to mark out that analogy feels very much like metaphor. And even Cajetan, you know, the great cardinal, makes the point. I mean, that's called improperly proportional predication, metaphor. But let's not go there for the sake of your poor listeners who are thinking, oh, this is all so esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should say as an aside that, you know, there was quite a bit of terminology that I was unfamiliar with in this book, although you certainly helped me a lot when we were exchanging texts about it. But I did have that immensely satisfying experience of as I went on, like, I could tell my thinking is being refined, even if I don't understand maybe, you know, on the surface level, maybe like 25% of what he wrote. And, and I mean, on the surface level, because obviously, I don't have a deeper understanding of most of it, probably. But even so, I can tell like my my mind is not the same having read it as it was before. And there's really something satisfying about trying to lift something that's heavier than you can than you can carry in, in that sense, just going going above your head for a while. Yeah, I, and I'm glad to hear that. Because I mean I surely am not doing this for the money. It's publishing's not a place to make money. It's a worthwhile exercise though. I mean I read the first major Thomist work I ever read was Maritan's Degrees of Knowledge. I don't know if you've ever tried reading it. It's very I, haven't, I haven't read it yet. Book. Very difficult book. It's worth it, though, for this reason. You know, flashes of like brilliant insight from the author, but you leave it feeling like you said, like, you know, you've skimmed the surface of, you know, 15% of it. But, and what's funny is Garrig is not even in his most technical in this book. <laughs> yeah, I can believe that because he's giving a sort of an overview of sort of a summary treatment of some topics that he treats in much greater detail in other works, as I understand. Yeah. Okay, so here we come to the topic of of theology because you've you've talked about the the analogy of being. So the formal object of theology is not God insofar as he is related to us. So I'll just I'll just say that and let you go from there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so at this point, you know, we've talked about, you know, for instance, how we can know God and all of these sorts of things, but our our basic outlook has been how we know God by you know, reasoning to him. This is, you know, what the philosophers talk about doing in metaphysics or natural theology. But, you know, as I said to, as I said to my students, you know, God would remain God, even if he had not created. God in his inner mystery is something immensely more than God the first cause. The metaphysician looks upwards and sees God kind of as, you know, reflected through our knowledge of creatures. But that's like looking at God through the most dim, 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 dim of mirrors. To know God as the first cause is a very indirect way. And the gift of faith is, I mean, it's a supernatural eye that we have. The Thomist position on grace is that the very object of faith is God obscurely known in the inner mystery of the deity, the inner mystery of what God is. It's a participation in his own self-knowledge that we have here below. And so no amount of, you know, natural reasoning ever, you know, reveals to our mind any sort of supernatural truth whatsoever. And this has repercussions, I mean, throughout really the whole of our, our moral life, as well as the life of the theologian as well. Because if theology really is rooted in faith, it takes its point of departure in this supernatural light. To make, it makes for some problems, too, for the person who doesn't have faith. They really can't be a theologian, Caragou thinks. But anyway. Well, yeah, that, that would make sense. I certainly agree with that. 
he makes some very important points, and it just seems as though the entirety of his philosophy, as I've encountered in this book, is all about preserving the distinction between the natural and the supernatural so that God can be God. He talks very early about the importance of God not being accessible to the senses, because if he were accessible to the senses, then he would not be God. He would be something proportioned to the senses, not the completely superior being that he is. And then it's important that his intimate life is not accessible to reason, because then either he would be something that is on the level of reason of natural things, or we would be supernatural in some sense, being able to access the supernatural with our reasons and and our intellects would be proportioned to the divine being. And then we would have pantheism. So, the, I mean, there's all sorts of different important things you can take away from his discussion. But yeah, I mean, it, I don't know where else we can go. Of course, we could go in any, num- any number of directions, but it's just fascinating to really sit down and reflect on how distant we are from God. I mean, it's easy to say that, but all of these small, important distinctions that Gargul Grange makes really point to this huge, hugely important distinction. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons for people looking askance at him, because he he fell out with, you know, he and Henri de Lubac don't agree on, on exactly how to parse this distinction between what's natural and what's supernatural. But it is like a golden thread running through Garagu's mind. That if you don't make this distinction, the things that you say could follow from it. That you won't understand the grandeur of what the Christian is called to and to the life that we begin living here below. If you don't see that it's an essentially supernatural life, it's very, I mean, very important in his mind. And what's interesting, he has these chapters. I don't know if you remember reading that first chapter of the second section of the text, where he talks about, can reason prove if there's an essentially supernatural order of right. truths? yes. Very, I mean, it's a very technical chapter, I would think, correct? Yeah, for sure. But, you know, I mean, you're well, I mean, you know, well-educated, you know, so, you know, I'm not trying to scare, scare the listeners away. But at first, it seems like this sort of odd question to ask, but he's very concerned with showing, like, almost as high as reason can go. And he, he even says, since we're aware that God can know himself in the highest way, we can say by reason that, that there's a supernatural order of truths that we can't know. Like that is like this golden highest point that reason can go and then is mute. Yeah. As to the content of that supernatural order. Yeah. But that's, I mean, it's very important to, to just sort of take time and, and stay there. So, you know, just sort of meditatingly stay present to that fact that you're able to know that point. And this is what, what the Thomists refer to then is you can even have a non-efficacious desire for that. You can have a desire that would say, I can know of that. And it would be so wonderful if I could know that mystery, if indeed it were possible. And yet it's not, for I see not how it could be. And this is precisely what there's no demand that nature can make to be fulfilled by the supernatural order by Father Gary Gulagrange. This is why the second chapter then moves on to this question. We can't actually demonstrate that the direct vision of God is, is something we know by reason alone. And it sounds so technical, but it's, it's the, the life of our life. Because when that answer comes, whenever by revelation, we find out that we are actually called to that immense and eternal life that un- is unchanging in the contemplation of God in the hereafter, we actually find out that our highest hope is fulfilled that we never could have dared to hope for. As with so many things reading this book, I found myself being forced to separate concepts that I had sort of lumped together. Now, of course, I knew that, you know, having a relationship with God as father is different from just as as the creature to the creator. But, you know, when we think about desire for going to heaven, we kind of lump together all these things that desire to be serving, loving God and serving God perfectly, the desire to be at perfect peace with God as our creator, the idea of existing in an order of perfect happiness and justice, the desire to be loved by God in some sense, to be with God in some sense. But the the beatific vision, what it is in itself, is more than just sort of 
being with God as the creature is to the creator or something like that, even if that were were able to be done perfectly on its own order, that the beatific vision is truly something that I cannot really conceptualize or or imagine what it's like. So I, I it made me realize that I've hardly even as a Catholic for, you know, twenty nine years, I've hardly begun to desire the beatific vision as it is in itself. Yeah, because the only concept that expresses it is the vision itself. Yeah. That's it, right? And yet what is it? It's you know, it is all these things that you say. I mean people have very good and, and correct desires for heaven. But above all, it's the intentional union in the same life, in knowledge and love, that is the divine life. It's not a pantheistic confusion, but it's, I mean, we will live through knowledge and love, the very life of God, in an unmediated fashion. The concept, if we can use that word, the concept that we will know is actually God, directly. You know, which is, this is, this is making the beatific vision sound like something static. We'll share the life and love of God, I mean, directly. It's immense. And that's our life here below. That's what faith starts here below. Grace starts here below. Right. Yeah. Participating in it already, but not seeing it and certainly yeah. not necessarily experiencing it in a psychological way. Not that it is something that can be experienced in a psychological way. And that's another thing that he, that he says that, you know, we, by faith, our intellect or our psychological experience cannot tell us whether we're experiencing something supernatural, whether it's the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, whether it's whether a certain act is motivated by supernatural charity or some human motive. You know, it, it's not that we can't have a good sense of these things from sort of external indicators, but they cannot be demonstrated. We cannot know for certain with our intellect or based on our experience in the sort of subjective psychological sense. Yeah, which is, I, I just think, a great example of, I mean, this, this immense sense of mystery that he has, that even in the living out of our life of faith that, it's, that this is the case. This is also why at the end of the book, he talks about the, the nights of the senses and the nights of the spirit. Sure. Because that's you must be pure must be purified for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's I, I will say just as an aside, I, I haven't read De Lubach's work on natural and supernatural, but I do based on reading Garagu's argument, I do tend to agree with him that, you know, whatever you can say about the heights to which man's natural desires can reach, as with his his knowledge, if man were to naturally desire in an absolute sense the beatific vision as such, that would mean that man's nature is proportioned to the supernatural, in which case there would be no need for grace to elevate us to that level. So it makes sense to me that not only the reality and the achievement, but the actual desire itself would need to be brought on by grace. Yeah, and that's at least what the Thomists, you know, who who get worked up at the Lubach, think they see. And it's not completely clear. That's clearly the bent. I mean, he would never, he doesn't hold, of course, that nature demands grace. Delubach doesn't hold that. Of course. But, you know, someone like a Garagu says, we've got to be crystal clear in making our distinctions here. It's very important. But the Thomists say distinguish in order to unite. If I remember correctly, Delubach said he loved to say, ah, but you should first unite things in order to be able to distinguish them. As you know, so to a Thomist, it's just two different ways of going about things. So I, it, it just gives the jitters to the Thomist. Right. So there was a big question that I've had for a while that this book basically answered for me, and that is, what is it about the theological virtue of faith that makes it supernatural? In other words, I tend to think of sort of the the external things that make faith credible, for example, the longevity and the the consistency of the the Catholic Church, things like that. As sort of the reason that faith seems credible to me, not not of course the reason that I that I think I know these the things that faith teaches through reason, but you know I also know that people have the capability of simply arbitrarily deciding to believe things without knowing them and without having supernatural faith, and also that you know through miracles and things like that people can come to conclude that something the truth of something can't be denied. So what is it exactly that makes faith supernatural? And what he says is something quite profound, which is that the formal cause of faith is not the external authority of the church, although that's an instrument that the, is used by the formal cause, 
the formal cause is the voice of the father speaking intimately in my soul. And that is what act is actually causing me to believe these things. And that makes faith a far more, you know, aside from charity, even faith itself is a sort of intimate participation in the life of God, which is something that I hadn't really considered before. Yeah, this is a very, very, very important thing in his book, De Revelazione. I mean, the whole book is actually on this topic, 1,200, 1,400 pages worth, that it's very important to, to have what's called a judgment of credibility, that it's rationally believable, both for kind of miraculous reasons, as well as the fact that revelation fulfills our deepest desires to believe, that reason should be able to say, that is something I should believe. And yet there's an infinite separation between saying, that's really and truly believable and belief. Because the act of faith, like you said, I mean, it's such a wonderful line, right? That, that it's the voice of the Father speaking, speaking in us, that we believe, as the Thomas say, or St. Thomas says too at the Treatise of Faith on Faith at the beginning, that we believe precisely because God reveals. And of course, that sounds like a kind of slavishness. Well, because God says that I do it or I believe it. But no, it's because I've seen now the truth of this. There's a beautiful passage from Henri Dominique Lacordaire that he cites somewhere else. He was a great French Dominican preacher in the 19th century, where he talks about, you know, there's the man who, you know, he's walked about, and he's, he's seeing the beauty tr and truth of the faith. And he sees the stunning story of the martyrs. And you could even say the coherence of Catholic doctrine, etc. But he can't make the transition. He can't make the step. And then one day, and Lacordaire says something like, you know, was it on the street corner? Was it by my fireside? I, I don't know, but I saw and believed. And from that day, I, I had faith. And I mean, this is, it's a, there's something ineffable in faith precisely because it is this new life. There's beautiful stuff in that encyclical by Benedict XVI, Space Salve, where he talks about faith really taking this theme from the Epistle to Hebrews. It's the substance of things hoped for. I mean, it is the bedrock beginning. I mean, it's not, you know, we're not saved through faith alone. Charity alone is the thing that's, that we must have, right? But we can only have charity if we first supernaturally know the Father. So charity is the full budding forth of this obscure knowledge that we have mm. of the Father, of the Trinity, of the mysteries, supernaturally. And so faith is, there's a certain in, interpersonal element to faith. We, we think of it as like knowledge, but I mean, it's, it's this profound relationship that we have that's a knowledge. It's a knowledge, but it's, it's a relationship with God who reveals. Yeah. And I had often wondered, you know, in faith, am I, I know that faith per se is not my own reason, but I had often wondered, am I ultimately still not depending on my own reason? And that was because I didn't sufficiently separate the things that make faith believable from the cause of faith. So the sort of supports that faith have are still not the cause of faith. And it is true, those supports do depend on, depend on my, my reason, of course, guided by God and the light of God's actual graces, to see that certain things are cannot be proven to be contradictory or things like that. But ultimately, the cause is something supernatural. So it, it did very much help me to sort of resolve that issue that I, you know, had just sort of had to set aside because I hadn't been able to figure it out. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, and it's a great thing in one's spiritual life to be aware of this. I mean, you know, we, we live as humans, so we have to see that it's, it's reasonable. Like we have to defend the faith to ourselves. And St. Peter tells us that we must do this. But, you know, I'm not going to go wading out too deep in current ecclesial controversies. But we realize that, you know, kind of the outward stability of the church's life, it's very important. It's incredibly important as a mark of the church, but it's not at the foundation, at least, of what our faith is. I mean, these, right. these sort of at least reasonable things. Yes. Anyway, this is why the spiritual treatises of Father Gary Goodlegrange are so important, too, because his, his incorporation of St. John of the Cross and the idea of the, the purg purgations of the soul are so important because our faith has to be purified precisely for the reason that it has this kind of this this super eminence over the level of reason this way. So I was just going to say that he says something similar with regard to hope. 
that, of course, we cannot know what is going to happen in the future. We cannot know unless we have a special re- revelation, whether we will have final perseverance and things like that. But you have the the certitude of hope is based on a tendency, but it is not based on, tell me if I'm totally butchering this, but it's not based on the graces we have experienced in the past, or this or that grace, and this or that example of God's goodness that we've had in our life, it is based on the goodness of God himself. So again, the formal cause of hope is not this or that manifestation, it is God's goodness itself. Yeah, it's hope is founded on the the sureness that we have, that the providential Father, through his Son and in his Spirit, will provide for us to eternal salvation. And so it's our trust in God for us, or it is our tendential certitude. It is, he does talk about it as a certitude of tendency. It is our tendential certitude while here below that we're sure because God indeed is that good that he is the one who helps on the way to salvation. That's why the theological mm. virtues are specified by, by God. God is obscurely seen the, in his mystery, faith. God in his mystery as the great aid of, of the believer, hope. God loved in his immense goodness for his own sake, charity. Okay, so it seems like the, the climax of this book in many ways is his chapter on the eminence of the deity. We've talked about this difference between God as he can be known through philosophy, through his attributes and things like that, and God as he is in himself, as he knows himself, the intimate life of God, of the Holy Trinity. And you mentioned at the beginning of this interview, in particular, the idea that the philosopher can discover these names of of God, the divine attributes, and yet not know how they are all reconciled in the deity, and how the deity is somehow above these divine attributes, even though they are identified with God by the philosopher. This is a obviously very mysterious right off the bat. So one example that he repeatedly uses is how do we say that God's in the Godhead, God's justice and God's mercy are identified, that he is justice itself, he is mercy itself. And yet we do not say that God punishes by his mercy and, you know, saves by his justice or is merciful by his justice, but they are somehow both in God. Yeah, or he doesn't He doesn't punish by his beauty, as I tell my students sometimes. Right. And yet his justice is beautiful, but it is not the same. So we have all these yeah. questions of distinction, what kind of, in what sense are these things distinct, in what sense are these united? So I'll just, yeah, let's let's talk about that a bit. Yeah, that's, it's it's not the last chapter, but I think it's the most beautiful chapter in the book. I thought it was so beautiful that I named my daughter after Kajit, for crying out loud, who who is the <laughs> central figure in there. Her, her middle name is Gaetan. No one ever pays attention to it because it's too weird. <laughs> but it's it's a beautiful, beautiful reflection on the fact of the the absolute unnameable eminence of God. I mean, as we said about the beatific vision, the only word that speaks the beatific vision to us is the actual vision itself. Because somehow, eminently in himself, God as God, the, the deity, one and triune, is or, you know, has all of the meaning of beauty and unity, right? His unity is is immensely strange. It's a triunity existence that's self self subsistent. That he is he is he who is the highest of wisdom, the highest wisdom ever actually wise and always being wise. All of these things. If we say how do those exist in God, we don't say that they're there separate. We just say they're there as God. I mean, it's an unspeakable mystery. So I apologize if I'm you know somewhat you know stammering the point. But, you know, Cajetan says in a quote in that chapter, you know, I have it in front of me, luckily, but I didn't know if I was going to actually get to it, but it's so appropriate to my stammering. He says, you know, before all the other ways we can know God, you know, through various ways that we attribute properties to him, we can consider God in himself, you know, in, a, in accordance with his own nature. And we, it's an impossible word in, way, in a way to translate, but it basically reads, and we circumlocute. We talk around, we circumlocute around this nature of God by means of the term, the name deity. So it's, 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 it's immense. It's this one little word deity, which is like throwaway. It's like, yeah, okay, 
God abstractly considered, what we're actually trying to say is he who actually contains all of these perfections in an eminent manner and contains the mystery of the Trinity all as the deity, because there's no distinction except for the opposed relations of the persons. Right. Yeah. And so and when, you think, when you think of all of these other topics in the book, it really does represent a great meditation on just how supernatural God's supernatural life is. And then that that we should we should fall to our knees in appreciation for the fact that we've been given a participate a real participation in that life mm. through grace. Amen. Yeah, because you know, again, before reading this book, I would have said God's justice is identical with his mercy. And again, as they actually exist, they're not distinct in the Godhead, but in the analogical sense in which we speak of them using those words, we can't really say they're the same, but they are as they exist as the deity. Uh, maybe I'm butchering it correct. even there. Again, it's, it's mysterious, no. but... No, but you're correct. They are, they are one in a, an eminent nature, and they're, they're separate. If we want to get really into the, the heights of Thomas' vocabulary, they're distinct according to what is called a minor virtual dis distinction or a minor conceptual distinction by way of that which is implicit and explicit. But it's a conceptual distinction, which doesn't mean that it's just subjective that it's just our kind of distinction that we're throwing around. But whenever you get into the case of God, all of this stuff is actually there. It is the same because it's all contained somehow mysteriously in the eminent reality that's the deity. This is a theme that deserves, you know, meditation and why it's so important to read someone like Garrigou who knows the school so well and all of the debates that surrounded this from the 1300s on. I mean, there were many, many debates over these matters and it required the Thomas to get very laser focused on it. And I mm. think that the book, and I think you can attest to this, the book actually inspires awe, which is, I think, a mark of its truth and why it's so worthwhile to, to do this. I mean, it's really hard stuff, but boy, it's worthwhile for the spiritual life, I think. Yeah. He also discusses sanctifying grace. And I mean, the question that I, that I have is, and I, I can't say that I fully understood his response, but he does tackle this question, this potential objection is, if, you know, goodness, oneness, beauty, et cetera, are things that all creatures necessarily participate in, why don't they naturally participate in deity itself? Yeah, it's so, I mean, the copy, we can say, the copy that creatures are as natural creatures. This is why the distinction between nature and the supernatural is so important. As natural copies, as finite copies, they, they don't, they don't, they're not actually their formal cause to be very technical, but their formal cause is not the deity. Whereas the formal cause, the objective cause, the formal object of grace is the divine life. And it's what, that's what's unique about spiritual beings is that we have a capacity to receive this. It's, it's an open capacity. We talked a little bit about this earlier. We can't demand it, but we have this openness through our obediential potency, the theologians call it, to being elevated to the supernatural life. And that's what grace is, is this, it's why it's so different than anything natural. Yeah, I guess I don't still, I still don't fully understand since, you know, God is not divided, there's no distinctions other than of relation in him in a real sense, how the formal cause can be one aspect of God and not God himself. Yeah, let's take a platonic moment, because this is what I've, I've done with students before, but it's, I think it works. You can copy one very beautiful thing in many, many, many different ways. And so natural creatures are just, we could say, once again, we're circumlocuting around the mystery, but natural creatures are only a natural copy, whereas the copy that's engraved in our soul by grace is a kind of supernatural copy of God. My words are, are failing, so you know, I'm, I'm simplifying things. But you can copy one thing a multitude of ways without changing the thing you're copying. Hmm. This is actually, this is at the heart of certain major divisions between Palamite thinkers in the Orthodox world and Western thinkers. So, I mean, you're, you're touching on an issue that's, you know, ancient. Okay. Well, I uh, <laughs> probably won't figure it out in this podcast, but could you just very briefly touch on the way he treats the Trinity in that same chapter in the context of these distinctions we've been discussing? Yeah, this is one of these quotes from Cajetan that's sort of nosebleed difficult in the text. But he makes the point that, you know, it's not when we think of God that we have to try to fit him into 
okay, is he one or is he relational, right? Is he one or is he three persons? As though there's some kind of division we have to fit him into. But rather, God as what he is, as the deity, is in some way you can say, he's not above being one and three, but he contains both that which is one and that which is three in the very eminence of what it is to be God. It is a beautiful quote, but it's a, it's a, it's a very tortured quote as well from Cajetan in that chapter where he talks about this. Yeah, and it goes back to a question I had had earlier in the book, which is he's talking about how if it were possible to prove that there is no contradiction between God's unity and his trinity, then that would mean that we would know by reason that the Trinity exists because everything that is in God is necessary. So we can, if we can prove mm-hmm. that it's possible, and we can prove that it's necessary. And again, this is another way my thinking has been refined because I believe in high school, I could be misremembering and maybe I just didn't pick up the nuance. I believe in high school I was taught, you know, reason can tell us that this is not contradictory, but it can't tell us that this is the truth. And of course, it's a very understandable way of sort of flattening that concept. But my question had been, how would somebody respond to someone who said that given the revelation of three persons and one God, so we know by faith that the multiplicity of persons and one divinity is possible, it must then be possible for there to be more than three. And the only thing I can think of as a response is that, well, faith tells us it's not impossible. It doesn't tell us why it's not impossible, and we must assume that because God is infinitely perfect, the number three in terms of persons must have some perfection that a, what we would call a greater number would not possess. But that's as far as I can go with that. Yeah, so two things. I mean, one, yeah, you very astute reader, I mean, you picked up on this little tiny theme that if you positively prove that something is not contradictory in God, you would then prove it. In the end, because because yes, this would not be true so of contingent things like the incarnation. Although we can't prove that that's possible either, but with the Trinity, is this the, so, the intimate life of God? So everything there is necessary. There's nothing contingent. Yeah, exactly. Now, of course, you, you can show that objections are not necessary. Is of course what one can do, and you can show that the Trinity is reasonable in a sense, but you can't actually apodictically prove it that way. Now, the other issue you bring up, yeah, it's one of these interesting ones of how do you not end up with a sequence of continued persons? And this is where in Trinitarian theology, the, you know, the deployment of the idea of relation becomes so important to show that, I mean, it's just, there's no way to really articulate even, you know, that there would be another person. Now, of course, we take our primary data that it's revealed that there are three persons, but it's, 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 you can show theologically that it wouldn't, it's not even reasonable to speak of there being a fourth as well. So we've talked about the importance of preserving this distinction between the natural and the supernatural, recognizing intellectually that, you know, God is above our senses. We we cannot sense God. And then that the deity is above our our reason, that the experience of these things The mysteries of God, the divine, the intimate life of God, our experience of grace, our experience of charity, our experience of faith is not verified or verifiable by psychological phenomena or anything like that. But of course, it's necessary to recognize that not only intellectually, but to conform our will to not desiring those things or valuing those things as though they were the intimate life of God itself. So that's why he concludes the book with a discussion of the way in the, the ways in which, you know, depending on the person, um, because not everybody experiences these these dark nights in the same way or at all necessarily, but it is necessary nonetheless for everybody to be purified of attachment to these things that are not God in himself. And he plugs it in to this whole concept of clarity and obscurity. So maybe you can, we can wrap up with that. Yeah. So we've hinted at this already. And of course, he thinks that, you know, we all have to go through some kind of purification like this for our, you know, actual spiritual maturing. Because his language is John of the Crosses, it does tend to have this monastic intensity. I think we're still waiting for the great, you know, lay theologian to help those of us who need a different account of kind of the story of how this applies to us. But, you know, he's well aware that, I mean, we know with great sureness all of these various truths of faith that that are proposed to us by the church. And yet, because of 
you know, the supernatural character of faith, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially the contemplative gifts of understanding, knowledge, and wisdom, have to purify our faith so that we have, you know, an inexpressible, what he calls quasi-experiential, you know, encounter, we'll say, with the mystery, with God active in the soul through the theological virtues. And that really, you know, in the end, we, we can't come to full spiritual maturity, which is another way of saying really, too, because we only live one life. We can't come to the full maturity of what we're supposed to be as humans as well without undergoing the purifications that the Carmelites speak of so uh, beautifully. And I mean, you know, it's important to remember that, of course, all of this talk about obscurity is ultimately undergirded by the idea that God is the ever actual flash of absolute intelligibility, a light that is so bright that it blinds us. And here below, we, that's why faith is, is obscure, is precisely because it's limited to our human capacities here below in a way that, that, that it isn't in the beatific vision. And so it's not just an obscurity that's, oh, I'm getting lost in the mysteries, right? You know, kind of sort of haze of, I don't know, new ageiness, right? But instead, it's precisely because God is too bright for our minds. You know, we could also say in some ways, God is too lovable for our hearts. And that's why we have to increase in charity through all of our life as well. Last week, I was sort of Googling around related to Garagou Lagrange, and I found this article in Homiletic and Pastoral Review from, I think, 2014. And I can't remember the name of the priest who wrote it, which is probably for the best, but he just kept referring to Garagou as a manualist theologian. And he didn't even really make an argument. He just ca kept calling him a manualist, made a brief reference to his support of Vichy, and <laughs> that was it. And, you know, I, I don't know if there is any truth to this overall idea that there was such a thing as manualism, but simply, but I've just based on reading Garagou, this one book, I can tell that you can't just dismiss him as a manualist. And, and it just strikes me that even five years later, I mean, there's a lot of changes going on in the Catholic intellectual world, but even five years later, I think that somebody who simply dismissed Garagou as a manualist, that would be, I think that that person would cause himself not to be taken seriously at this point. Yeah, you know, I do know what you're, you're speaking of, and only right at this very instant did the author's name come to my mind. And you know what? It's a difference of upbringing. I can't explain that kind of knee-jerk reaction, but that is a, that's a great example of probably what was inherited from the formation that he had a generation back. You have to remember, a lot of these texts weren't even really available. You know, there was this sort of, there was this flourishing moment where a lot of these texts were being republished by these little presses 10 years ago. But whenever that author, Pastoral and Homiletic Review, which I think very highly of that, the, that periodical, I've written some things for them over the years, but he would have just imbibed this. I mean, I think that some of it's just a knee-jerk thing. It's amusing. Garagou himself laments the state of the manuals of his day precisely for the same reasons. Like there could be common cause. We, we would speak a different vocabulary. I'm sure this author would not be a strict observant Thomist like Garagou. But Garagou is an anti manualist of sorts. And I, you know, I could write, once again, I could write a monograph just on that. But, you know, I think that it's important, you know, as a, a younger scholar to remember that so many of these things were just the inherited kind of knowledge. And it, it's, it's hard to imagine if you're someone 10 years ago looking and, and kind of standing against this tidal wave that would be very much against preconciliar theology. Right. right. So it's important not to get too angry at these, these folks who, who inherited this kind of incorrect narrative. I'm saying this as a kind of therapy for myself. I always have to keep myself calm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I understand. Well, it also struck me that I think people of my generation who did not grow up feeling that they needed to defend Vatican II exactly, or, or that they took it for granted and did not feel like they had to defend it as against things that came earlier. I don't even mean in terms of a clash of pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II doctrine, but just in terms of a way of of seeing things on the ground level. I use that expression too much. It doesn't even mean anything. But yeah, <laughs> it's just interesting. I think I think it's just a general, as you say, it's a generational thing as well. And you can see that in a lot of ways where people are questioning the received wisdom on things like religious liberty and saying, is that actually what 
Vatican II said, and we need to interpret this in terms of in the light of what had already been taught in the 19th century and, and things like that. I mean, there's just a lot of that going on. So it's interesting to look at this phenomenon with Garagou Lagrange as part of a greater shift in Catholic thought. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good analysis of sort of where the, the mindset is nowadays. Yeah, it's not a kind of archaism. It's just trying to I mean, reorient really the kind of hermeneutic theologically and philosophically and ecclesially to, to kind of incur, in, include this broader view and not inheriting whatever was inherited as kind of the necessary task that faced people in their minds, at least in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And it's on many fronts, as you know. Sure. Okay, well, that's a great place to wrap up. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your your wisdom and expertise. Well, thank you. It was a really good conversation. And just I hope all your work continues apace. It's very enjoyable. So have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. Today's reading is actually a quote that I found in that article on chastity by Matthew, which I am linking to in the show notes page. It is from the Anaphora of St. Basil, to Prayer Against Heresy. By the power of your Holy Spirit, end the schisms in the church, quench the raging of nations, and quickly destroy the insurrections of heresy. Receive us all into your kingdom, showing us to be children of light and children of the day. Grant us your peace and love, O Lord our God, for you have given all things to us. Amen. Amen. 